care about. We find ourselves, even as a, as a young believer, I would start talking to people about prayer, and they're just very insecure. Like, I, I, was, I remember sitting in a meeting with a bunch of Christians. They went down a bunch of lists of prayer requests, and then somebody goes, okay, let's pray. And I was like, like, doesn't God hear them? Didn't he just hear what we just said? So now, and I learned that prayer meant you had to bow your head and have a special voice, right? You don't talk to God in your normal voice. You have your prayer voice. Heavenly Father, we beseech you from on high that you would just bestow upon us. You don't use this language in your everyday life, but something about prayer causes us to go to some magical place. Some of you may have given up on prayer, and there's, there's no guilt in that. I get it. Um, I only reason why I kept praying was because of fear in my early walk. I was just scared to not pray. It's almost like it becomes a superstitious thing. So raise your hand if you pray in public places. I'm going to hang on to this mic. I hear y'all back there. I'm hanging on to this mic. I'm hanging on to the mic. I'm hanging on to this one. I'm hanging on to this one. Raise your hand if you pray and, and eat. Okay, do you pray when the appetizer comes or do you pray when the meal comes? See, Baptists do not pray to the milk. The ab- you can have nachos. The Lord understands that, right? The Lord knows the nachos. You don't pray before you eat your Skittles. This cracks me up because people freak out, right? If I start eating, this happens to me all the time. You're the pastor, I know, but you just ate Skittles before we came here. You didn't pray for those Skittles. So you're not really as, this has become a, a tradition and a superstition more than we even are thinking about what we're doing. And if I say something about it, you get offended and you push it back on me. Like, I'm the crazy one. But I used to struggle with prayer because I didn't understand it. And I grew up, and so when I was like three or four, I think I was, maybe I was older than that. I was probably in the third grade. I got into a fight with my mom, single mom. And I got into a fight with my mom, and I was a, I was a terrible young kid. And, and I fought with my mom, and then I said, you know what, how can I hurt her feelings? Like, I knew as a kid I could hurt her feelings. So I said, I want to live with my dad. And she said, okay, go to your room. So I went to my room. I wake up in the morning. My dad was on the porch. My bags were packed. I still haven't forgiven her for this, by the way. I was like, what? He's like, come on, son. I was like, no. And she's like, mm-hmm, go on with your daddy. And I remember just, I cried all the way from Oklahoma City to Topeka, Kansas. I cried because I could not believe this woman. I have never said that to her ever again. <laughs> I've never said to her. And, and, and when I moved to my dad, they were a Pentecostal church, and he was the minister of music is what they called it. He was the minister of music. And they prayed, and it was emphatic. I mean, by the time they were done praying, you were on the throne room floor of heaven, ascended. I had never seen it before. I had never knew what that was. I'd never been around people that just pray for that long and that spiritual. I'd never seen that before. And then I became a Methodist church youth pastor, and the Methodists pray without moving their mouth. I mean, this is the quietest church I've ever seen. I've never seen a church. They just say, let's pray. I'm like, are y'all going? <laughs> Who? Somebody got this? We are praying. It's the quietest church I ever went to. The Methodists were quiet. And then I came here in the Baptist church. When I came here, y'all prayed, but one person prayed. Everybody else would sometimes nod, and then y'all clapped at the end of it. And then I was like, what are we clapping for? And then they got mad at me, like, you don't clap after you pray? Well, God doesn't hear that prayer. I'm just kidding. But you know what I'm saying? So there are all these, prayer has a culture to it. And if you haven't, if you haven't really thought about it, you just regurgitate what you saw. And you just assume the text is saying pray in the way that you, you know prayer. And if we're not careful, this becomes an area of our life that we're never challenged in. Because pastors are so busy, they don't pray, so they don't preach on it. Because I'm not going to preach a sermon about what I do. (laughs) No, only your stuff. (laughs) So it's like, like, where is Scripture trying to take us with prayer? And I hope that maybe somewhat answer that. The question I'm trying to think about is, like, how does prayer work? That's That's what I'm kind of thinking about while I'm talking this morning. Like, how does prayer work? And the cool thing is, our fearless leader comes on the scene 2,000 years ago, and he flips over the tables on prayer. And if I came up here and told you, you guys have been praying wrong, you'd go, okay, DJ, who do you think you are? And that's basically what Jesus does in today's text, is he comes on the scene and goes, you guys aren't getting this right. And he challenges them. And I'm hoping that we will be challenged today. And if you're a new Christian, this is cool. I mean, if you're a new Christian, I wish somebody would have started me here. Now, full disclosure, I was mentored in prayer by Pastor Rick. And it flipped the tables over my spirituality because that's not how I was taught to pray. That's not that prayer culture that I was used to. You pray with power. Glory to God. You pray in the spirit. Glory to God. And things get done. And Pastor Rick gave me a whole nother experience. And it almost was too easy. 
I start learning the kingdom is just about simply. The kingdom is about simple. Prayer is just simply talking to God. And we, we, something about church people and religion that wants to make it more difficult and make it more rigid. And we want some sense of ownership and some sense of work. And as Protestants, we love prayer without works. Faith without works is that we love to work, 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 work. And there's something about prayer that messes with us and discombobulates us because it's just too simple. But that's really how prayer works. And let's look at the text. If you have your note sheet, if you pull up your Bible, Matthew 6, 5, this is what Jesus says. I'm using the NLT. It says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. So Jesus is unlocking some stuff about prayer that I just had to really start thinking about when Pastor Rick started mentoring me in prayer. He's like, I need to rethink this thing. And we think, and and John Wesley uh, talks about uh, spirituality. He talks about it being a house. And he talks about so many Christians just live on the front porch. And that's how I feel about prayer. Like, there's a whole house to prayer. And some of you, for the last several years of your life, and some of you for your whole Christian walk, have this. I'm not saying you don't pray, and I'm not saying you don't pray right. I'm just saying you haven't experienced the whole house. You just sit on the front porch, and you become victim to the weather. You are still a victim on the front porch. you got to go in the house and experience the whole house to really walk in victory and to walk in power. But most people are content with just being on the front porch. And so they just pray about what they need. And this is, I need this, I need this, I need this. And this person needs this, this person needs this. And prayer is much more deeper than our prayer requests. God is up to something when we pray. And in this text, we see one thing that's, co- here's the thing. We're going to pray again because I can already tell you guys are staring off and I'm going to come against the devil on this because the people that are staring off are the ones who need this sermon. So we're going to pray and and we're going to start over. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to stay focused this morning. We make war against the enemy this morning. The enemy does not want us to be connected to the Father. And this is why we're angry and this is why we're so offended. And this is why we desperately are out of touch with who we are as kingdom citizens, because we are not connected to the source of life. So help us get these nuggets that we may grow deeper and more connected to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. This is our challenge today. Like when he said, the first thing Jesus lets us know, and I'm going to throw this, this is the first point. Let's get that. Prayer has a place. This is not a rule, but I just want you to understand there's a concept here. There's a truth here. There is a place for prayer. I have no problem with you praying on the go. I think a part of praying without ceasing is praying. And listen, sometimes you be in a meeting and you teachers know when you're in that classroom in the class, you're praying and talking at the same time. Lord, don't let me kill these kids. Lord, don't let me kill these kids. Lord, Lord, let, hey, come on, y'all, put your books up. Don't let me kill them, Lord. You know, I, I get that. Praying and you're praying and you're multitasking. But there's a time and place where you stop being busy and you sit with the Lord. You just have to do this. And what I love about this is Jesus says, you don't have to say, this is not about having uh, the right words. This is not about how long. So I don't get to go, and you need to do this for 12 days, six hours, four. It's not about length of prayer. It's not even about, I'm going to get in some trouble, with some of you theologians. It's not even about how good your theology is. It's about you understanding the Father's heart and how much he loves you, and he wants to be with you. Two minutes, four minutes. We know this about relationships, that we can't just be planning our day and call that a relationship. Every marriage in here knows that. Like, yeah, okay, you go get the kids, okay, I'm going over here, okay, I'm going to go get, no, you go over and get the, okay, I got the donuts, okay, you go get the, okay, and then that's how we do every single day after day. You know that there will be some distance in your relationship. It won't be as intimate. There comes a point where you have to get into each other's face and start sharing your heart with one another. And that's what God wants from us. And Jesus said there's a place that we do that. As a matter of fact, on your note sheet, and I'll put it on the screen, but when you pray, go into your room and close the door. He wants some un 
interrupted time with you. We know this. Everybody in this room gets mad when their kid stares at the phone and talks to you at the same time and they're looking at their phone and you get offended. You, parent, get offended when your kid looks at their phone and tries to talk to you and, and look at their phone at the same time. Yet, we will do this to God every day, all day, 24-7 and try to pretend like it's not that big of a deal. And God understands. No, you get it. You get it. You know that this is an important thing for us. And it's much more deeper than us getting what we want. It's about being connected. Knowing the Father intimately. And we need to intentionally start saying, okay, Lord, where's my place at? Is there a secret place that I can pray with you? Is there a place I can get? You can find them all over the place. The hospital has a prayer room. It's only used during tragedy. I'm not kidding. There are secret places all over the place. You have to intentionally seek them. You can find one even at your job. I bet you the job. And it may be the bathroom, but Lord, use it. Turn it into the threshing floor. Glory to God. But a secret place. Over and over again, we see Jesus do this. Luke 5, 16, the beginning of his ministry. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He did this often. Even after great miracles, he has this great miracle, lots of followers. After sending the people away, he went up by a hill by himself to pray. Like after something great, Jesus went and prayed. Because he, this is the Alpha, the Omega, the Creator, God, the one that's everlasting to everlasting, the one who sustains the world by his righteous right hand. The one who breathes life into every living being is taking the time to talk. To the Lord, talk to the Father one on one. I think it behooves us to be challenged to do the same thing. To spend some time with Him. And remember, I'm not talking about quantity and I'm not talking about quality. I'm talking about just your heart and bringing your heart to the Lord as much as you possibly can. And when we get to the point that we understand that we need it, when we get to the point that we understand that something powerful is going on when we do this, I honestly believe you won't have to be begged to do this anymore. If some of you would just start doing it, the results are going to blow your mind. God is so good and so awesome and so compassionate and so wonderful that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time doing this before you go, you know what? This is where it's at. This is where it's at. I tell you the truth. No lies. The only reason why I'm standing here for the last two years that I've been through is because of my one-on-one -on -one time and other people's praying. That's the only reason why I'm here. This is my Wheaties. This is what I eat. And I'm challenging you to say, okay, God, I can give you a minute today. I'm going to pick a place and spend one minute. And even if it's just praying Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And you just pray that out loud to the Lord. And it just takes 30 seconds. And you just go, and amen. I believe the Father's going to honor. And the promise is, not only is there a praise, prayer, the cool thing about prayer is, prayer has a payback. He says, I promise to reward you. And it's much more deeper than material things. I'm sorry that TBN has lied to you. And told you this is about Range Rovers and Land Rovers and houses and cars. That's, that's, that's the street. Gold we walk on in heaven. And the Bible says you can have anything Scripture says you can have. And you can go anywhere the, the Spirit leads you to go. When you become more like Christ, it's evident in adversity, in setbacks, in good times and bad times. What happens is your prayer life is less about things in your life changing and more about you changing. And I think this is why most of us sleep during these sermons about prayer. I think this is why most of us avoid it. Because at the end of the day, who really wants to change? Even if it's better. But there's a reward to prayer. And could it be possibly we've been living on the front porch in this area of our life? Is it possible that we've just been going, okay, I'm praying. And some of us stopped praying. I prayed for my 110-year-old grandpa. He died. It doesn't work. So I'm done praying. And like we, 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 we give up on it because it just doesn't seem to work. And some of us are just guilty. we just like, we're going to do it. And so it becomes this four-leaf clover. It becomes a superstition. 
we find ourselves praying and we really can't understand why we're even doing it. We're praying for our food, but we really don't know why because we ate sometimes a day. We didn't pray for that. And now we're praying for this one meal and we don't know why. It just seems like the right thing to do. And we don't even really think about what it is that we're doing. And Jesus is going, prayer is about your heart. And it has payback. And I'm like, man, what have I been doing this whole time? <laughs> you can talk to God and be busy and never feel connected. We know this with relationships. You can talk to God and just be busy and never feel connected because connection comes from intimacy. And I'm challenging you to be intimate with the Father. And where are you at with that? And some of you, it's going to be weird. It's just weird. I don't know if I can do this. And that's what makes it great. Because the cool thing about prayer is there's a reward. The Bible says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. That word blessed means to be envied. And when you start connecting with the Father daily, I guarantee you, there'll be some people envious about how you go through adversity the way that you go through it. How do you survive the way that you survive? How do you smile? How, how do you take the cancer treatment the way you take the cancer treatment? How come I see everybody else murmuring and complaining? I believe this is the number one reason for offense in the church. It's hard to spend intimate one-on-one -on -one time with the Father and the Creator of the universe and then come out angry and offended and bitter and unforgiving and greedy and no self-control and no love. If you spend time with Him consistently, it will change your heart and do a work in you that you've never experienced before. And it has nothing to do with your pay paycheck, nothing to do with your kids behaving perfectly, nothing to do with anybody else's perfection. I'm going to say this to you leaders, and this is free. You know, I won't charge you for it. You will only be as strong publicly as connected you are privately. You will only be as powerful publicly as connected you are privately. And if you're leading a workforce, if you're leading a team, if you're leading a classroom, if you're a part of the government, if you're doing all this stuff and you're trying to keep your cool and you're trying to operate in your own strength, you'll, you'll do well for a while. But kingdom citizens need this one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. Believers need this one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. So that leads us to this thing that prayer has a passion. It's about your heart. Prayer is not about a bunch of words and how to say it right. Prayer is about passion. It's about your heart. God wants your heart. He wants you. He wants you. And this is why some of us overwork, and this is why some of us never work for the kingdom, because we haven't taken our heart and brought it to the Lord. So I got a group of you in here who do everything. You do too much. You don't have time to pray. Then I got another group of you who are just like, I'm unqualified, I'm disqualified, I'm a victim, I can't do anything, I have zero talent, I have nothing to give. Both sides need to spend more time with the Lord. And what you begin to learn when you spend time with the Lord is that you can't do everything. Nor does he want you to. Nor is he asking you. Do you know how freeing that is for a pastor of a church this size? That there's no way I can meet with you guys one-on-one. -on -one, and if you leave this church because I wasn't there with you one-on-one -on -one, and you didn't get a disciple and you didn't start making disciples and you didn't go apart with the Bible says, I'm perfectly free with that. I, I get it. Go find a pastor who'll do that because it's ridiculous of me to think that I could do that. That is so sick. You are so unhealthy if you think you can do every single ministry and be a part of every single thing. And if you don't do it, it's not going to be done right. That means you haven't spent time with the Lord. But the flip of the hand is you don't do anything. You just sit and watch. And you think that it's a spectator sport. You can just come here and watch the show. Let's see if pastor says something he's not supposed to this Sunday. And that's all you do. You have no discernment that God has created you and formed and fastened you for a reason. And if you would spend time with him intimately, that will start being discovered. It is so cool to wake up and live my life not based on somebody else's viewpoint about anything. That I can be independent from what other people think. And, other, and most leaders, I'm saying most, are leaders because they're insecure. I'm just telling you the God honest truth. Mo, it's very few that leaders just come on. I'm just so humble and so precocious. I want to lead and just love on people. Most leaders come from a sense of insecurity, and God takes that insecurity, molds into something special, and the end result is they become a powerful leader. But most start from a place of in most of what's wrong with everything is rooted in our insecurity. Most of the fights at work are insecure. We walk around, nobody knows that we're insecure. <laughs> And so you wake up, and you're trying to be impressive. And the first time somebody says you're unimpressive, you get your feelings hurt because <laughs> you thought you were impressive. And we're just not as impressive as we think we are. Amen. 
Look at something y'all can't say. It ain't nothing. I'm county commissioner. I'm impressed. <laughs> like, no, you're not. I drove on these roads before. You're not. See, he said it. He finally did it. I knew he was going to say something. It was like we think we're so impressive and spend time with the Lord. It's about his holiness. That's why Jesus later on will say, our Father who art in heaven, you are holy. Holy is your name. You start spending time with the Lord, you start learning how impressive God is, how awesome he is. You don't leave out of your quiet time with the Lord going, man, I, oh, I'm impressive. You say, DJ, what's your takeaway from this sermon today as I close this thing up? God wants your full attention. That's my takeaway. God wants your full attention. Just like you want your kids full attention. Every once in a while, can you just sit down and talk to me like a normal person, kid? I made you. Same thing God's saying. I want your full attention. I don't need all the words. I don't need all the special talk. I don't need the beseeches and the bestows and the thoughts and the, the betrothes and the... I don't need all those special words. I just need you. The same way you give yourself away all day long to other people. Bring some of that to me. I want you to Go home and find a place where you'll meet with God. Two minutes. Four minutes. If you've been doing this, keep doing it. This is where the power is. I saw this scripture. I was doing some cross-referencing. I came across this scripture. This is the message version. God's in charge, not you. The less you speak, the better. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> Takes away from my sermon, Lord. You're taking away from my sermon. The less you speak, the better, DJ. It's like, Wow. I think we go, okay, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Let's just open up this word and let God speak to our hearts and let's just spend some time nestled in it. Let's see what he says. Maybe prayer is more about what he thinks and what he says and less about what we think. Maybe prayer is more about his will and his desires and less about my will and my desires. I'm just suggesting that. I'm not saying that's true. Matthew 6, 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need. So you don't have to go over all your prayer requests. He knows exactly what you need. And if you're doing that, that's great, but don't just stay on the porch is what I'm saying. Once you get through your prayer requests, get off the porch and go into the house. That's what I'm saying. Don't stay on the porch. Don't, don't put a cot out there every day and, you're, and then you put up a little lamp and you live on your porch. And you're missing out. It's deeper than you going over what you need from the Lord. It's deeper than what you think you want. God is inviting to us to connect with him intimately. Now, you, you know there's a scripture that we just read, and I want to tell you this, and then we'll pray. When Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles who babble and babble and repeat themselves over and over again, don't be like them. He's actually quoting scripture. He's actually referring to an actual scripture in the Old Testament. And what I'm learning about Jesus is every time he says something, you can find a reference in the Old Testament. And the actual reference that Jesus is referring to when he says, don't be like the Gentiles. All right. So first he says, don't be like the hypocrites. He's referring to the Jews. He's talking about them. They pray publicly. They play in synagogue. We know he's talking about the Jews because he says they go to synagogues and they pray. So we know the first part, Jesus is talking about religious people. The second part, he's talking about worldly people. He says they babble and they repeat themselves over and over again. The actual story is in 1 Kings or 2 Kings 18, and it's about Elijah. And Elijah shows up to challenge the gods of Baal. He challenged the people of Baal, the followers of Baal, and they're having this contest to see which god can cause fire to come down from the sky. And these people are praying for hours and hours, babbling and saying the same thing over and over again. Fire fall down, fire fall down, fire fall down. And Elijah starts talking trash. He's like, so is your god asleep? Maybe your god's taking a restroom break. Ah, your God is having some issues with his spouse. So Elijah is talking trash to them, and they for hours and hours and hours are praying and babbling and saying the same thing over and over again. And then Elijah prays, and he simply basically just says, you're God, you're the man, make fire come. Whoosh! Elijah was so confident about God, he dug a trench he filled it up with water. He made the conditions so non-conducive for this miracle. 
And the Bible says the fire just sucked up all that water, sucked up everything, just consumed everything present. It was a 30-second prayer. I'm not kidding. One verse, barely a sentence. Later on, James, Jesus' like half-brother, step-brother would say, Elijah was just a man like me and you. Because the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And the reason why they availeth much is because Elijah was connected privately with the Father. He knew what he was capable of because of a private connection, not because he was trying to show off publicly. And I think we put the cart before the horse. We want to show off publicly, and we might get with God later on. Do me a favor. Don't you lay hands on me till you talk to God about it, till you spent some private. Don't come to me. Let me pray for you, Pastor. Have you talked to God about this? Don't go around publicly doing stuff that you don't do privately. Jesus is flipping it over here. He's saying, you know what? Maybe, and I'm talking to you leaders who serve at this church from this point here. Maybe your, maybe your burnout and your anger, and even on Sunday morning, maybe Sunday morning doesn't work out for you because you're just not connected. Busy, 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 busy. And when you get overly busy and you don't get any sleep, yeah, you'll punt a four-year-old. You're just like, get out of here. Because you're just, you are just tired. You're wore out. You can't take it anymore. And all I wanted was some more juice. And they don't know what's going on. Like, they was reading those Bible stories last week. Now they're cussing us out. I'm just a four-year-old asking for some juice. And maybe we are freaking out because we're not connected. And for me, I'm learning that the reason why I like to share what my problem is is because I Google my problems and a billion people have it. That's what I found out. All you got to do is Google your problem and then like billions of people go, this is what happened to me. I'm learning that I'm not the only person with this problem. For me, before I'm accountable to the deacon board, before I'm accountable to this church membership, before I'm accountable to my mentor, my, my staff, I'm accountable to the Father. And one of my main passages about spending time one-on-one with the Lord is I'm accountable to him. See, you can't put me in heaven or hell. You can vote me out. You can fire me. You can't put me in heaven or hell. You can cut my pay. You can cut my vacation. But you can't put me in heaven or hell. You can go, DJ, I don't like you. That's the most arrogant. I love that person. Takes you out to dinner just to kind of tell you how much they don't like you, like they're that important. I just smile at you. I eat the food that you pay for, and I go home and laugh because you're just not that important. (laughs) <laughs> You're just not. I'm accountable to the, the Father. Like, we're all accountable to the Father. We got to, we got to pray about this. We got to seek His face. So here's my challenge. Last week at 11.45, I said, we're going to pray. 11.45, start a revival me. And I was doing a funeral yesterday, and my, my 11.45 popped up while I'm preaching. I went, oh, I... <laughs> I thought that'd be kind of, you know, in the middle of a funeral, say, will you pray, Lord, start a revival me right now? That wouldn't probably flow very well. But it, so I had to pray that prayer at 1145 last night. But this week, what I want you praying about is, what is, where's your place? Where's your place in your house? Do you have a place where you can go, just you and God? Do you have a place? I'm not being legalistic. I'm not being rules. This is what Jesus said we should do. Are we going to take him serious or are we going to ignore him? This ain't what DJ said we should do. We just read the text. He said, don't be like religious people. You pick a place, shut the door, talk to your father in secret, and he will reward you. If you're already doing that, I'm asking that you would continue to do that. So that's the rookie. The rookie, if you're an amateur or rookie, pick a place. If you're kind of a pro, you've been doing this for a while, I want you to spend, ask yourself and try to discern, do you spend a lot of time praying about other things to change and less time about you changing? How often do you bring your heart to the Lord going, change me more, Lord? And how often do you pray, change this, change this, change this, fix that, fix that, fix that, change this, change this, get this, get this, get that, okay? That's difficult. If you're all pro, you're a prayer warrior, you pray gift of ministry. You just pray. You're a prayer warrior. My prayer is that you would find a secluded place. You would continue to do that prayer, but you would also start bringing somebody with you. If it wasn't for Pastor Rick discipling me in this area, I would be lost. All right? 
So I got a challenge for kind of where you're at. If you're a rookie, two minutes this week. Find a place. Say, Lord, I'm going to spend some time with you on this chair right here. If you're a pro, instead of praying about God change, go ahead and pray for God to change what you need to change, but spend even more time praying about God changing you. And what areas of your life does God need you, are you discerning God needs to work on in your life? If you're all pro, I want you to partner up with somebody. Disciple them. Well, you are staring at me. We're going to pray because I've been getting some licks. We're about to have a spaghetti luncheon, so I'm going to pray for the food before we go out there. You take your chairs with you. Bring your own chair party. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Everybody in here is going to eat somewhere out this week. Everybody in here is going to eat somewhere out this week. If you can't stay to eat, would you please give to these kids who want to serve the Lord what you would normally pay on the eating out? The answer is no. I get it. Okay, very good. Sometimes they say no, Mom. Sometimes they say no. Let's, let's pray. Lord, I thank you uh, this morning. I know you, you hear us. I know you've been hearing us. You hear our hearts. The Word of God declares that you know unsearchable things that man can't know. You, the Holy Spirit utters words we don't understand, and only you and the Spirit understand it. So you already know what needs to be done in this room. Or that person who's coming to you this morning, that person who's just now figured out that they love you and they want to spend the rest of their life with you, Lord, I pray they would make it known to somebody in the room that they just gave their life to Christ. They want to follow you. Well, I pray for that couple that's trying to hold their marriage together. But I pray that they would just spend more time with you together. They would come together and sit with you. Lord, to the teenagers that are in the room, I pray that you would help them not make this subject matter taboo, that you want to hear from the kids. And Lord, to the middle schoolers and the adolescents in here, that you love it when children open up their mouths and talk to you. They don't have to say it right. And Lord, lastly, to that person who's in despair, that person who is dealing with more than they feel like they can bear, Holy Spirit, do a work in their heart even now. They would know you're the God who rights the ship. You're the God who gets us through the storm. You're the God who helps the boat stay afloat. Raise our trust level in you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, before you leave out of here and when you grab your chair to go eat, make sure you tell somebody it as an encouragement and confidently, God's going to do that thing. Go ahead and tell them. God's going to do that thing. Go ahead.